All right. So good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Clausen with the Niagara Lake Museum. Thanks for joining us for the second talk in our virtual lecture series this winter. We're going to be recording today's session. So for any reason you get kicked out or you can't stay for the full lecture, we will definitely be sending that to all the registrants afterwards and posting it on our uh, our YouTube channel as well. Um, and as always, we'll have the question and answer and the chat function open. So if you want to send any questions for Jessica or have any comments or anything, I'll share those with her at the end of the presentation and we'll have some time for questions. Also, if you want to support any of our free programs like our virtual lecture series, we always uh, appreciate that from uh, members and friends. I'm going to put a link in the chat box and if you want to make a donation, we always appreciate that. So today we're welcoming Jessica Lindell presenting her master's thesis project, Reimagining Niagara Using GIS to Study Local Economic Development from 1783 to 1812. And Jessica's a Grimsby resident who has worked in volunteers and volunteered in various local heritage sites since 2016, earning an Ontario Heritage Award in 2018. Her MA thesis, which she defended in January of 2021, focused on trade, communication networks, and economic development in the Niagara region during the early Loyalist period. Jess, Jess currently works as the Community Engagement Manager at the Brown Homestead in St. Catharines, while also contributing to a few different historical research projects at Brock University. So welcome, Jess. I'm going to turn it over to you. Can you see my screen here? Yeah? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here today and for your interest in my research. Uh, my name is Jess and I'm excited to share with you the work that I did for my master's thesis in history at Brock University. I started this project in the fall of 2018 and finished towards the end of 2020, defending my thesis, as Amy said, in January of 2021. So it actually feels like it's been a little while since I've really dug into any of this, but I'm lucky that after graduation, I've been able to continue uh, working in this field of local history. So it's remained pretty fresh in my mind. I currently work, as Amy said, as the Community Engagement Manager at the Brown Homestead on Pelham Road in St. Catharines. It's a fairly new host museum in the community, if you haven't already heard of it. Um, we've been around for a few years now. The house itself has been around for almost 230 years, built in 1796. I want to start off by saying thank you to the Niagara-on-the-Lake Historical Society, specifically David Murray and Elizabeth Surtees, who actually partially funded this research when I was given their scholarship in 2018 for choosing to work on a Niagara-based history project. So thank you very much for that. My thesis illustrates um, Niagara's post-war transition from its role as a transshipment point in a larger transatlantic trade system into a productive agrarian economy by the early 19th century. My goal today is to provide you with a basic explanation of what all of this means and how I use GIS, which is short for Geographic Information Systems, to come to some of my research conclusions. I probably should have shown you that when I said that. Okay, so it's a little bit of project background. Um, I'd actually never used GIS until I began my history MA in 2018, and I was encouraged by my thesis supervisor to try approaching this thesis topic from a geographical perspective. Um, I was interested in looking at trade patterns in Niagara during the first few decades of Loyalist settlement post-American Revolution. Focusing more closely on geography kind of made sense to me because economic development here during the Loyalist era was so tied to the land itself. In 2016, I worked as a summer student at Nellis Manor Museum in Grimsby while I was in school at Brock doing my undergrad, which is where I kind of really began learning more about local history specifically. And then when I decided to pursue a master's, it made sense for me to pick a local topic. And I'd become really intrigued by the stories of individuals who lived and worked on the same soil that you and I walk every day. The digital humanities are a somewhat newer field. Um, the field of spatial history emerged out of late 20th century advances in, advances in computer technology. And as you can imagine, history and digital tech are not the most compatible subjects. So learning GIS software was like learning, it was a huge learning curve for me and it, and it honestly still is. It was like learning a whole new language. And I'm not an expert by any means, but in doing this, I realized it offers so much potential. And even after graduating, I've continued using it in my current work. 
I don't want to scare anyone off with the technology talk, though. Much of my paper is also based on like traditional historical scholarship and regular textual investigations of like government documents and travelers accounts, and those kind of things that weren't projected onto the GIS. Um, my project incorporated the use of GIS to enhance my study of economic development in Niagara during the post-revolutionary or the loyalist era. The accounts of local farmers and millers, particularly that of Daniel Servos, was I'm not sure how to pronounce Servos. I've asked Amy and she said that it's been pronounced a, a few different ways. So if, if you think I'm saying it wrong, I apologize. <laughs> That's how I'm gonna say it for now. Um, so his, his account books were used as the foundation of my research. And in this work, I investigated Niagara's loyalist farmers and their relationships with merchants and the British government over a period of three decades from 1783 to 1812-ish. So late 18th century account book data was interpreted through GIS to depict patterns of production and consumption from a spatial angle. And then by mapping the historical da uh, data and analyzing it alongside geographic features in the Niagara region, GIS brought a fresh perspective to what I think is a pretty familiar topic. So what exactly are those conclusions? Um, before I go there, I first wanna explain what GIS is as well as how I collected my data. So some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's a computer system that lets you create, manage, analyze, and map all types of geographic data. GIS software is not typically used by historians. It's normally used by people in fields like environmental science or urban planning, um, where they'll use spatial analysis that digital maps offer to model and predict uh, land use and impact assessments. And they'll use all sorts of data like satellite imagery, aerial photography, remote sensing, and uh, statistics on populations or ur urban demographics to do their work. And at the core of their work are, are these data sets. And essentially when historians use GIS, we're also using our own data and visualizing it on digital maps and trying to ide identify patterns. So spatial historians or digital historians that use GIS will use a lot of historical maps and uh, usually have to build their own data sets using things like old censuses, assessment roles, um, uh, city directories, and things like that to kind of enter the, the population specific data. For this project, I wanted to use GIS because the more I read about it, the more I saw how it allowed for new understandings of old stories. And I figured Niagara and its commercial beginnings would be a good way to explore that. So I ended up compiling uh, an Excel spreadsheet with around 13,000 points of data. And I used that to create and explore an online web map, which you'll see here, this is what uh, a web map is. So my web map shows a small survey of what domestic exchange looked like for growing communities in Niagara, revealing who participated in trade, where, when, and in what capacity, as well as how this changed over a period of three decades. So I'll explain that, uh, as, as we keep going. Um, so what kind of data did I use in my work and how did I end up with the data sets that I added to this map? Well, the data set that I created was compiled from the account books of the Servos family who operated the King's Mills in Niagara on the Lake at the mouth of the Four Mile Creek. In my spreadsheet, I made 27 individual tables that's one per year spanning approximately from uh, 1784 to 1811 with information about the sale of lumber, flour, and potash at the King's Mills. And this is an example of what one of those tables looks like. Each table includes separate columns of data that contain the name of the customer, their township, um, the X and Y coordinates of their farms. So usually the 100 acre plots um, that are listed um, where am I? I'm losing my point here. Okay. Oh yeah, the qu the quantity and the value of flour being sold by Servos, and the form of payment, and there's a few additional notes as well. And this method was repeated on a smaller scale with lumber and potash sales as well. Uh, the years of lumber analysis spanned the 1780s, and the potash only from 1800 to 1801. And this was just simply because of um, what the account books offered. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute, um, some issues with the sources, but um, when added to the GIS, these attribute tables appear as point data that can be individually selected 
to reveal the metadata of that farmer's transaction. And so this is what I mean here. If you click on one of these, this is the, the metadata that will show up that you just saw in that spreadsheet. So I also added a few historical map layers as well as modern ones like the Niagara escarpment boundary, um, some soil and floodplain layers. I was able to access most of these through Brock's map data and GIS library. I'll zoom in a bit so you can see them. This is the one of Niagara on the Lake, obviously. At the time, it was Township of Niagara. So to find the coordinates for the individual farms where the customers of the Kings Mills likely lived, I used historical maps of Niagara townships, as well as Upper Canada land petitions and some detailed ancestry research. Uh, the X and Y coordinates were pinpointed by overlaying the georeferenced historical maps onto the modern base map of Niagara, like I've done here. And then uh, within the GIS program itself, if I hover over uh, my cursor over the middle of one of these 100 acre plots, uh, the coordinates will show up. So I just manually um, copy and pasted that into my spreadsheet. So the thing about combining GIS with history is that it really complicates our work with primary sources. Um, normally as historians, we look at archival documents, diary entries, newspaper clippings and letters as qualitative sources. So when we bring in quantitative information found in sources like account books and ledgers, and then combine it with this really precise technology, it's a whole new thing to navigate. Some of the data on the map could be skewed because of issues with interpretation of these primary sources. For example, the coordinates used in this project uh, to pinpoint the locations of the farmers were determined based on a wide yet incomplete amalgamation of sources. Uh, for example, some names in the account books are indecipherable. Some names don't appear on any historical maps or in any censuses and archival references. Many families own multiple pieces of land in different townships and many squatted on land before receiving official title to it, meaning that the name on that plot didn't always accurately reflect which family lived there. And you can, you can see what I mean here. Uh, this is just one page of, of the first volume um, and it's this, it's, it's quite hard to read. So not all pages were this bad, but there are points where you, it's just impossible to, to read uh, what, what's been written. So um, also when looking at historical patterns over time, a continuous data set throughout those 30 or so years really would have been ideal for best results, but I made do with what I had, which is why the account books of the Servos family really became the core of my project. Volumes one to four in the personal account book hold some of the best, in my opinion, late 18th to early 19th century rural Niagara data in existence because they present much of the accounting history of one location in a linear fashion over the span of three decades. Although, as I mentioned, there are, there are some pieces missing. Um, and I didn't use volume five because it fell outside of my time frame. It's a little bit too late. So now we'll go on to my actual conclusions. Um, first thing I wanna note from this research is that living along the Niagara escarpment and its main waterways increased farmers' chances of being agriculturally and commercially successful. That's one of the very first things I noticed when my points were plotted onto this map. So by projecting the source and the quantity of commodities like wheat, lumber, and potash onto the map, I was able to make observations about where these centers of production or lack of production in with local transportation due to poor road conditions, even by the 1800s. People with access to main roadways along these creeks and the escarpment had an easier time traveling to the King's Mills and engaging in the economy more broadly. When I added this historical map from 1818 to the GIS, I noticed another interesting pattern. During the first decade of Loyalist settlement, there were large areas of land that remained uncultivated. And similar to traditional historical scholarship, the things that go unmentioned in the sources or gaps in the data can hold meaning. And as you might already see here, uh, when the 1818 map layer is overlaid onto the point data, uh, 
and the point data are the locations of the farmers bringing grain to the King's Mills. Um, you'll see the, the existence of a black, black swamp here uh, in the Grantham or the St. Catharines area. So if we swipe back, you can see it's right where St. Catharines is. Um, uh, and this suggests to us that the land impacted, obviously, the farmer's ability to produce surpluses of wheat because there's not really much production happening here. You have like this big empty space. So, uh, but then I was thinking as I was doing this, is success um, for these early farmers, was success tied only to location or geography or was there more to it than that? Uh, and how do we see environmental determinism correlate with human agency and the economic choices that people made? Obviously, there's a lot more to uh, success than just geography. So um, that leads up to my next point, which is that during the first decade of settlement, free labor, specifically enslaved black labor was essential for accumulating wealth. And the foregrounding of geography in this study does not negate the value of human agency. And in this case, the natural environment and human action were intertwined in their impacts on development. For example, both the proximity to manufacturing and sale points in the flour supply chain and enslaved black labor were essential to surplus wheat production for white farmers during the first decade of settlement in Niagara. And looking at this 1787 census of Niagara, um, you can see here, it says Negro slaves. So this is kind of where I was able to get these numbers from and um, be able to de determine which of these men uh, were slave owners. So, um, and then in looking at this census, I realized that in the list of the highest producers of wheat for that year, most of them used enslaved black workers and labor in Niagara at this time was so expensive. So this kind of placed slave owners in a category that few others could reach and Yet there were, there were more than a handful of families in Niagara that had brought enslaved black people and indentured servants with them from the colonies after the revolution, but not all of them were successful agriculturally. Like not all of them had high uh, wheat production. So why was this the case? Why were some of these people successful and not others, even though they all had access to free labor? So this led to my next GIS analysis to see if there were any connections between the top 10 producers in Niagara and the land that they lived on. So I mapped out where they lived and um, you can see, I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, with these names. You've got Elijah Phelps, Samuel Street, um, you've got some C chords, you have Adam Chrysler. Um, all these dots are the land uh, that they lived on, as you can see in this map. So I mapped out where they lived and came to the conclusion that not only did most of these top uh, producers employ slave labor, but many of them also farmed in a strategic location that aided with production. So you can notice the proximity of these people to the Seacord Mills on the Four Mile Creek, which is right here, um, and the central, here, oops. So this is where the Seacord Mills were. Uh, and then you also have the central shipping point at the landing in Queenston where their products could be exported. So this small stretch of land along the escarpment between the Four Mile Creek and the Niagara River was such a valuable transportation route for many of the township's top growers. And therefore surplus production required, uh, to me, it required a twofold answer. Um, in addition to enslaved labor, what also mattered was their proximity to the manufacturing and the sale points in the uh, flower supply chain. So the third thing I wanna to note today is that small communities formed around these centers of economic activity, um, but at the same time, they did not function in isolation from other townships or from external markets. So the GIS analysis of customers at the King's Mills throughout these three decades shows how these communities formed within different townships. Initially, the King's Mills brought together people from different townships, uh, forming con uh, social connections that cross multiple regional boundaries. And as an example, uh, we see Grimsby farmer, Jacob Glover. Uh, he came to the King's Mills with wheat and corn, but then he left with his milk product as well as brown sugar and rum. 
And then Servos also charged him for lodging, which made rent income a byproduct of his milling enterprise. So the exchanges in these early days show the formation of a greater community in the Niagara Peninsula. But as mills were built and merchant shops begun in other townships, people formed tighter connections within their own villages, investing in a local industry, largely due to the challenges brought by regional travel. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the benefits of GIS is being able to show developments that happened over time. For example, I was able to see how in the 1780s, before many mills had been built, around half of the King's Mills customers were traveling from over 10 miles away. And then by the 1790s, that number went down to 14%, at which point more mills had been built in other parts of the region and small communities were growing throughout Niagara. Um, yet, as settlement patterns developed semi-isolated townships dictated in large part by environmental barriers like the escarpment and seasonal uh, limitations, there was still inter-regional trade happening. And a good example of this is seen in the analysis of the potashery at the 15 Mile Falls, which is where Rockway Conservation Area is located today. And I actually grew up a few minutes away from Rockway. Um, my family and I would go for hikes there after church on Sunday all the time. So this is this is pretty neat for me to see. Uh, Daniel Servos managed the potashery here in the early 1800s, as well as one on the Four Mile Creek in partnership with merchants William and James Crooks. Servos hired individuals to bring wagon loads of limestone, empty barrels, cords of firewood, and provisions for the laborers at the 15. Uh, and much of that was sourced from Niagara Township and from his mill customers. Bushels of ashes were locally sourced around the potashery as a byproduct of land clearing. So these came from Pelham and Louth families around the, uh, you can see the potashery is this little red mark here. And all of these points, these uh, green and blue points indicate the farming families that sold ashes to servos for the potashery. And then the completed potash was brought back to Niagara on the lake and the Crooks brothers would then ship it in barrels to their Montreal trade partners. Let's zoom in a bit. Um, many of these farmers in Pelham and Louth not only sold ashes, but they also worked at the potashery in exchange for household items like linen, linen or tea from servos. So there were multiple elements of exchange going on here. And the goods they received in exchange were then put back into their rural economies by bettering their own farms and trading goods with their neighbors. So the use of local ashes and labor, along with externally sourced limestone barrels and cords of wood, shows us how this production depended on at least five different supply chains, if not more. Um, and the 15 mile community's economy was directly tied to other parts of the Niagara region as the elements of supply and demand were dependent on one, the, one another for the machine to flow properly. And then to zoom out on this even further, um, small commercial enterprises like the potashery or even other um, mills, salt works, distilleries and tanneries that popped up around the region, they didn't function in isolation from external markets. The credit required to fund these operations at the beginning was provided by merchants like the Crooks Brothers, who in turn received it from their partners in Montreal. Merchants as facilitators of trade in and out of the region introduced flour, lumber, potash, and other Niagara products into the Montreal market by the 19th century. And so we see how Niagara's potential fit into uh, these larger visions of the St. Lawrence economy. And I actually wrote uh, an article last month about the potash production um, here uh, for, for the Brown Homestead. So if you're interested, go check out the Brown Homestead's website and you can read it on our, on our journals page. Um, so these topics so far, let me scroll down a bit. There we go, okay. So for my last point, um, these topics so far are quite focused on uh, white loyalists, but in my paper, I also talked a lot about power dynamics and the privilege uh, people had in making economic choices, which leads me to yeah, my final point for today, which is that participation in Niagara's economy was limited by factors of race, gender, and class, and therefore individuals maneuvered through their own subjective social political positions within society in their own unique way. And take a sip of water. One sec. 
So when the Loyalists arrived in Niagara, they were introduced to this new land after having lost everything during the war. While this would seemingly put everyone on the same level, hierarchies quickly formed as some individuals had greater freedoms when it came to making economic choices. And much of these early stratifications were rooted in government land policies. So for example, in terms of race, the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations, although considered loyalists, were in a far different position initially than white loyalists in Niagara. Uh, they didn't have access to supportive governing structures to the same degree as white settlers did. Uh, yes, they did receive food and supplies from the government, but they also faced decades long battles over land rights and they were denied an Indian department representative to live with them at the Grand River. Instead, this man lived in Niagara on the Lake and um, they became increasingly isolated from their, their white neighbors. And the Haudenosaunee sought autonomy in their position on the Grand River, but that didn't mean that they were opposed to external relationships. They still desired uh, a measure of access to commercial liaisons and materials that would have benefited their place in the wider developing economy. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of sources um, like what we have with say like the service accounts that show the, uh, the agricultural production that happened um, on the Grand River. So it was, it was tough for me to, to be able to analyze that further, unfortunately, but go down to the next point. Similarly, uh, free black men in Niagara faced obstacles and they were given land grants from the British government and considered loyalists, but they were often unable to develop these properties because they lacked family support since a lot of them had wives and children that were enslaved in the American colonies. Also, if a free black man married a black female slave of a white loyalist, his children would still belong to the master. So domestic production and access to key markets in Niagara, uh, as we know, depended on the labor of the family unit. Um, therefore, it's extremely difficult for these men to legally gain uh, access to uh, the titles for their land. Oops too far. Um, and in order to gain title to your land at this time, you needed to clear five acres, put a fence around your farm, build a house and a road connecting to your neighbor within the first two years of settlement. Um, so to solve this problem in 1794, 19 black loyalists in Niagara delivered a petition to Governor Simcoe and they asked for a tract of land with lots adjacent to one another so that they could kind of group their labor and have a better chance of farming successfully uh, rather than continuing in isolation because a lot of them would like say Pierpoint had this land here but then another man might have a plot here and someone might have one in Louth or Clinton or Grimsby or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, one of the signees of this um, petition was Richard Pierpoint who you've probably heard of who uh, later helped create the Colored Corps during the War of 1812. But he and the others were actually denied their petition. So a trend uh, appeared at this time showing black men in Niagara working more often as just paid general laborers than as uh, farmers and un unable to um, uh, like gain assets and build mills, build barns and do all these things that uh, a lot of other families were doing and, and leaving these things for their children to, to build off of. So there's a lot more I could talk about, but I'll conclude here. While doing this project and reading these personal accounts and other stories of the Loyalists, I learned a lot about Niagara's history during this time period. Um, and I'm just, I was in awe of the hard work that a lot of these early settlers did to clear their properties, work their land, provide a foundation for future generations to continue to prosper. And I know that a lot of their descendants still live in the area today, which I think is really neat. Um, Overall, I found this project to be a challenging yet exciting entry into the world of GIS. Um, Niagara's physical features in many ways shaped the local markets that formed at this time, but human agency is also an important part of the story uh, that needs to be addressed. So by using GIS, this project provided insight into the relationship between the land and its people over time. Um, thank you very much to Amy and Barbara and the Light Niagara and the Lake Museum for inviting me to speak today. I appreciate the opportunity to share this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. We do have a few questions. So I'm just gonna uh, 
go through the chat here. If others have uh, more questions, feel free to type those in the Q&A box. Um, uh, Susan uh, Servos would like to know uh, if you know if the Servos family had slaves. I believe there was one that um, is pretty well known. Um, like it's not something that I discovered or anything. I know a couple people were aware of this. Uh, he had one named Robert Jupiter um, and he, there may have been more, but all I saw in the account books were references to a man named, named Jupiter. And then, um, yeah, if you, if you Google it, <laughs> there's actually a couple uh, resources online where it talks a little bit more about him and his life. Um, but he was, he, he was definitely part of that, um, that enslaved labor that helped the Servos family, um, you know, do, do well with their enterprises. So, yeah. Um, one of our members and former board members wanted to know if we could have a copy of your master's thesis for our research files. Is that something that you, you'd be willing to share for others as well? And I know you have a lot of it on your website as well. Um, and we can share that with, um, with everyone when I send out the recording. Uh, we can share your website too, because I know they can access a lot of that information there. Yeah, it's on the website. Um, if, if you want, I can email you a copy, Amy. Um, is that okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, make a note for myself. <laughs> um, Angela would like to know, how did you train in using the ArcGIS? Uh, did you use like a personal license for that or how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so actually Brock University has a map data and GIS library and they're, um, uh, her name's Sharon Jansen. I don't know what your exact title is, Sharon, if you're here, but um, she's she's the, the map lady who taught me everything that I know about <laughs> GIS. She's awesome. So um, I took a few little tutorials with her. I did a lot of tutorials online and Brock, I did a, an entitlement subscription through Brock. That's how I got my GIS um, software for my laptop was through Brock. Um, yeah, and then Sharon was very instrumental in kind of guiding me through those tutorials and then um, the rest I just kind of figured out. I did a lot of Googling and a lot of frustration and it still is, but like at least I know a little bit more now than, than I did at the beginning. Um, but there's like um, Esri is the company that makes the ArcGIS software and they have a lot of um, tutorials and um, frequently asked questions, answered, like they, they offer a lot of resources for people that use it. So um, yeah, that's about it. Great. And um, just on the same topic, do you um, have any knowledge of how long GIS has been used for this kind of research? Like, is it used in archaeology, for example? Yeah. So when I was doing um, the historical, like historiograph, it's called historiography, um, like looking at the um, different ways that people have written about this topic. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I'm gonna start over. I would say maybe seven, and uh, this is a hard question. <laughs> it, it's, been, it's been around for a couple decades. We'll say that basically since computers have have been around, people have been, been doing this kind of thing. And um, for historians to use GIS, I would say in the last 10 to 20 years, you've really seen a lot more publication on historical GIS projects by um, professors and academics in universities all over the world. There's a lot of really good ones in, in Canada that are doing different GIS, um, like spatial history projects. So I would say, yeah, like spatial history, digital history, it's been around for maybe 30 years, but in the next, the, the last 10 to 20, um, I've read a lot uh, about a lot of projects done in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and Jane uh, would like to know, um, there are remnants of a dam at the bottom of the hill below the Big Bend on 9th Street. Would that be the location of the potashery? Are you familiar with that? <laughs> Where is 9th Street? In St. Catharines? Because 7th Street, Louth is St. Catharines, so 9th Street would be one over. You know, there is, I have never seen it, but I have heard from someone, um, who also might be here, Isabel, um, <laughs> about uh, the uh, the remnants of the potashery uh, on in on the 15 Mile Creek. So I haven't seen it, but she sent me some pictures, and it kind of looks like a, like a couple wooden beams, like a triangle or not triangular, a, rec a rectangular um, 
thing in the ground with a couple beams that uh, apparently is the remnants of the, the potashery. And there's also um, remnants of a salt works there as well, which I really need to go check it out because I don't know where on the 15 Mile Creek it is now, but I've heard that there are remnants there. So you could be right. That, that might be it. <laughs> Um, she, she said the Big Bend by Rockway Golf Course is where she's referring to. I think okay. I think that's it because when I looked at the map, I, I just did a quick look on, on Google Maps when Isabel sent me those pictures and it did look like it was very close to the Rockway Golf Course. So you're, that's probably it. Um, I'm getting lots of um, just you know, well done and good job. So I'm going to share all of those, <laughs> all the, the chat uh, recordings with you after this so you can read all of them. Um, uh, Peter would like to know, in reviewing the historical records, were there any transactions with Americans, like maybe Lewiston farmers and things like that? Good question. Um, no, not that I saw. I, there might be, if you look at, um, I would, ugh, it's tough because Servos is such like, he was just a very small Niagara farmer. He wasn't, he interacted with a lot of people in Niagara Lake and St. Catharines, but not too far beyond that, but, but I wonder if if um, if we looked at the accounts of like Robert Hamilton or some someone like that, I think there'd be a lot more interactions with Americans. Um, unfortunately, I would have loved to use Robert Hamilton sources since he was like the, the most prominent merchant in Niagara at the time, but unfortunately he doesn't have uh, any account books or anything like that to, to look at. So to answer your question, I don't think so, but I I think it's just because he was such a small scale farmer. And Bruce wondered if Servos um, kept most of his customers over the period that you were researching or did farmers come and go? That's also a really good question. Um, they came and went. Like that's something that surprised me too was that if you had, if he had an account with somebody, it, it didn't stay for those, you know, 16 years in a row. It was very much like a couple transactions over a couple couple years and then they kind of moved on. And if you, like in, in doing the um, the ancestry research and kind of looking at, um, when I was looking for when these people, uh, where these people lived, uh, I realized that a lot of them would settle and then move within three years and then move again, or they'd move to York, like around Toronto. So especially the, the late loyalists, like the ones that came in the 1790s or the early 1800s, they didn't stay long because there wasn't really any land left uh, at that time because it had all been given away as crown uh, land grants. So um, for some of some of the, the common names that you hear of a lot, people like the Secords, uh, those are kind of longer lists of transactions that stayed for quite a few years. But, but yeah, a surprising amount of those were um, short term. And uh, do you know, I don't know how much you compared to other um, millers, but do you know how financially successful Servos was compared to some of the other millers in that time period? I'm not sure. Like, I still kind of want to look at the accounts, uh, like the mill accounts of the Secords, because I know that I'm pretty sure the Niagara Lake on the Lake Museum uh, has some of David Secords mill, mill records, I believe. <laughs> um, so... I, I, I can't really compare it because I really don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't answer that one. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Um, Isabel uh, was curious to know of the general numbers of indentured servants that she, ha she hasn't read much about that. Found that quite interesting. Well, let me go back to that. That census was interesting uh, from 1787. So Robert Hamilton actually wrote that census. Um, and there are, there's a, a column for indentured servants. So if I can go back. Mm, I have to like really look at it, it's hard to read. Um, I believe John Chisholm. So he, there, he didn't enslave anybody, but I'm pretty sure he had a handful of indentured servants, um, if I'm looking at this correctly. I need to get my the actual document because I've cut off a lot of it. Um, so I don't I don't know, Isabel, I don't know how many there were like compared to um, people that were enslaved, uh, people that had indentured servants. I don't I don't know. I, I hear about it 
pretty often. So that's something that I think is deserving of more research. If, if any other master students wants to do a project on, on that, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, David Snellgrove wonders why flour was so dominant as an agricultural product versus other possible items. So I think it was just the easiest thing to grow at that point, because as you can imagine, all these people are coming to this new land that was covered in trees, it was uninhabited, you have only your your families with you and the clothes on your back and maybe some whatever provisions you could take with you. So it was very, very like backwoods. Um, you had to grow what you could uh, in order to survive. And uh, wheat is pretty sturdy compared to uh, other crops. So and it was also something that was always in demand. Um, if these producers wanted to produce surpluses of it and sell it, um, the British Army would always buy it. You have uh, Fort Niagara and eventually uh, Fort George, Fort Erie, these places where these uh, British officers are stationed. So there's always, there's a ready market for it and it was easy to grow. Great. And Amanda wondered if you're interested in continuing this research and filling in more information for the South Niagara areas. I would, I would love to. And that's something that I, I feel a little bit bad about. Like I didn't, really get to learn a ton about like Port Colborne, Fort Erie, Dunville, like even Thorold and, and Welland or Niagara Falls, like I, like, I guess it's just a, um, because I use the service accounts, that's why. Maybe if I had chosen an account book from someone further further down that it, it would have given a different result. Um, also the southern part of Niagara just wasn't as inhabited um, as the northern part in the first decade or so. Um, and I was really interested in like those very first years of what happened from putting your feet on the ground to the next generation. Um, I don't know if I'll continue if I don't have access to like a really good source. Like I don't, if anyone knows of any account books from farmers or millers that live closer to the, the south side of Niagara, like send me a message. I, I'd love to see it. Yeah, we, we could definitely uh, even reach out to our museum network and see if any of the archives in those communities have anything, because that would be um, really interesting to know. Mm -hmm. um, would looking at trade during the winter season give you info uh, about Amer any American connections? There was a lot of back and forth across the St. Lawrence when the river, when the river froze. Probably, probably. Um, that would be less of a Niagara-based uh, history then I think I'd have to be looking more at like Kingston or something a little bit like closer towards Montreal uh, which would have been like it's a broader scope if, if I did that I think I think for sure if, if someone looked at it from from that standpoint there would be a lot more connections to American trade I know um, I even saw in a, an account from the early 1800s of potash exports from Montreal like half of the exports in one year I don't know if it was like 1804 1805 about half of that actually came from the states because it had been imported at um, uh, one of the one of the ports along the St. Lawrence River. So there's definitely a lot of products coming from America, for sure, or the American colonies. Um, and then just the final question is: Can you post the source of the census that has the list of the um, the slave owners? The one I think that is up on the screen currently. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, 1787, written by Robert Hamilton. Um, I can, I, I'm trying to remember where I got it from. I think this was from our uh, Library of Archives Canada. So I don't think it has uh, an online, um, like, like, like I can put it connected to a website. Like I think I have it as a PDF. So um, I'm pretty sure this is something I got from. Uh, yeah, Library and Archives Canada. But I can send it to you, Amy, as well, if you, if you want, and you can send it along. Happy to do that. Sure, that would be great. Um, oh, one more quick question. <laughs> uh, do you know when flower trade declined and the move to fruit occurred? Hmm. That might be outside your scope of... Uh... Well, it's kind of cool. And, and I do write about this in the thesis. Like, there, there are some mentions of fruit growing, like, really early before 1800s already. And not 
so much for um, purposes of making money, like to sell, but more just for having treats around your house and making pies and, and preserving in, in your cellars and stuff. So I know um, there were peach trees. Um, if you read uh, Lady Simcoe's diary, she talks about peaches and cherries, I believe. Um, there are a few apple trees. Uh, I believe it was Robert Hamilton had apple trees. Um, so there was a little bit of fruit growing pre-1800, but it wasn't for any sort of like commercial reasons. Um, and I would think when Niagara started becoming more of like the fruit belt, I would say a lot, a lot later in the 1800s. Um, I know, uh, like, I'm not as well versed in the, the later 1800s and 1900s history of Niagara, like I, I should be, but I'm gonna say later 1800s, maybe 1860s to 80s, that's my guess, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, somebody did ask if um, the presentation will be available to you again. So we did record today. Um, unfortunately, I got kicked out a couple times, so there might be a little bit. <laughs> I might have missed maybe a minute of her presentation, but I will be sending out the recording to everyone who's registered, and we'll also have it up on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so there's lots of great comments in here, Jess. I'll share these with you because um, so many people are fascinated by your research and thinks think that it really adds to our understanding of the Niagara region and the history of this region. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, our next lecture is in two weeks, so Wednesday, uh, March the 2nd, and Caitlin Vest, who's working with us on contract right now, digitizing um, items from our collection, uh, she's going to present Apothecaries to Pharmacies, Prescriptions, Potents, and Healthy Herbs, and she's looking at um, apothecary materials she's found in our um, archival collection, and, you know, what people were using um, as medications and, and what those look like today. So, hope you can join us in two weeks for that presentation, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for joining us today and thank you Jessica. Thank you. Thanks for coming everyone.